quote, conspiracy and a cover-up. Prosecutors today reminding the jury of the basic facts of this historic first ever criminal trial of an American ex-president. As we come on the air, closing arguments are right now underway in the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump. We're getting live updates from inside the courtroom. We're going to do our best to watch them together and bring out, interrupt our conversations and bring you any and all significant moments as they're happening. Over the last few hours, prosecutor Joshua Steinglass has been going through the claims that were made by Trump's lawyers in their closing argument this morning. Steinglass, the prosecutor, pushed back against Trump's lawyer's claim from this morning that porn star Stormy Daniels was extorting Donald Trump. Prosecutor saying this, quote, extortion is not a defense to falsifying business records. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask the judge. After putting on the stand just two witnesses, one of whose credibility completely crumbled during cross-examination, Donald Trump's defense team today closed by arguing essentially that there was never any criminal conspiracy to conceal the hush money payments. Trump's attorney, Todd Blanche, also went after Michael Cohen aggressively and loudly, calling him the, quote, MVP of liars and the gloat, get it, claiming he lied to the jury without, as The New York Times points out, quote, presenting a smoking gun that clearly shows that to be the case. And just in the last hour, Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass got to work in addressing and doing any cleanup he thought necessary on these questions around Cohen's credibility. Steinglass telling the jury this, quote, we didn't choose Michael Cohen. We didn't pick him up at the witness store. Mr. Trump chose Mr. Cohen for the same qualities his attorneys now urge you to reject. Whew. Noticeably missing from the defense's arguments this morning, any and all push back against that wealth of documentary and circumstantial evidence, all of it corroborating Cohen's testimony before he ever took the stand. Blanche on that front claimed that there wasn't a shred of evidence regarding the Trump Tower meeting where the repayment scheme was hatched. That is not true. Blanche ignored in his clothes the handwritten notes entered into evidence from Alan Weisselberg that showed exactly how the $420,000 reimbursement payment was added up. Blanche, Trump's lawyer, also made a bold claim. He said today in front of the jury that that plan for the National Enquirer to catch and kill negative stories about Donald Trump ahead of an American presidential election was totally normal. Basically, everybody does it, that it was above board. Blanche arguing, quote, every campaign is a conspiracy to promote a candidate. To that, Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass called the agreement at Trump Tower where the plan was hatched a, quote, subversion of democracy, arguing that the whole point of the scheme was to, quote, pull the wool over voters' eyes. Blanche did not finish his closing this morning without doing something that earned perhaps the sharpest rebuke of this five-week trial from the normally very even keel Judge Juan Marchand. Blanche, in his close, said this to the jury, quote, you cannot send someone to prison, based on the words of Michael Cohen. Prosecutors objected immediately, and Judge Marchand said this, quote, I think that statement was outrageous, Mr. Blanche. It's simply not allowed, period. It is hard for me to imagine how that was accidental in any way. So then the jury went out after that happened. And later, when they came back in, the judge corrected Blanche in front of the jury, telling the jury explicitly that a prison sentence is not required in this case. And on Blanche's comment, the judge added this, quote, that comment is improper and you must disregard it. The prosecution is still underway in getting its final chance to hammer home the case against Donald Trump. It's happening at this moment, and it's where we start today with some of our most favorite reporters and friends. They've all made their way from inside the courtroom, which was very warm today, up to our very um, climate-controlled studio. For that, we're grateful. With us at the table for the hour, MSNBC legal analyst Andrew Weissman is back. New York Times investigative reporter Suzanne Craig is back, and former executive editor with American Media Inc. and special correspondent for the Hollywood reporter Lachlan Cartwright is back as well. Outside the courthouse for us, NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. Um, Vaughn, let's start with what's happening right now, and then why don't you and I work our way back to this Mershon uh, rebuke. 
Right, Nicole, the jury just re-entered the courtroom. Now, on a typical day at 4.30 p.m. Eastern is when court is ended. Everybody has been sent home. But earlier in the day, Judge Mershon made it clear that they would try to get through both sides' closing arguments by the end of today, essentially so the jurors could hear it in one major chunk. But now you're looking at a reality that just a few minutes ago there was a break that was announced. The jury left the room, and the prosecution, about an hour and 45 minutes into their closing, arguments were just asked by Judge Marchand how much more time do they have? They said they were just about one-third of the way done. So if you do the math, that could take us to about 8 p.m. Eastern if the time moves based off of their clock. Now, the defense, they went for about three hours this morning as part of their closing arguments. And when you compare the two sides, you can look at the defense. It was a rather simplistic, you know, uh, effort and contention that was made to this jury. It was twofold. Number one, Michael Cohen is a liar. More than 45 times I counted that Todd Blanche either called Michael Cohen a liar or said that he had lied. And then they are also trying trying to cast doubt, you know, a reasonable doubt in the minds of these jurors that Donald Trump was intimately aware of the scheme and what he was paying Michael Cohen for. On the other side of this, the prosecution, it's much more methodical. And that's why you could be looking at their closing arguments lasting anywhere by their own math five to six hours, mm -hmm. because it is on them to make the case to this jury that Donald Trump was not only intimately aware, but behind the conspiracy that went from August of 2015 all the way through 2018. Andrew Weissman, to, to um, Vaughn's great reporting, they're going to take a break in about an hour at 5 o'clock. Judge Marchand's going to ask the jurors how they're doing, if they want to keep going or if they want to take a break. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the prosecution would like them to come back tomorrow, just say they're fresh. It is. You know, it is a long day um, yeah. to sit there and take in all that information. And they, you want them to be fresh from both sides um, mm -hmm. so they're hearing it. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure Josh Steinglash is ready. I mean, in other words, he's, he's got everything buttoned down. It's mm -hmm. really very smooth. But in terms of, you know, what I think the state would want, um, I would think they'd want to, um, to take a break. But um, it's pretty clear from when we were there that Judge Marchand is going to leave it totally to the jurors yeah. and say, you know, he left it. He's so um, even keeled, as you pointed out. He just said, it's whatever you want. If you want to stay, we'll do that. And then he, but he also said, you know, you want to come back tomorrow? We'll do that, too. Right. Like he, with no, not trying to put a thumb on the scale. It's like, whatever you want, that's what we're going to do. And I mean, who would you argue it benefits if you come back in the morning? I think it benefits the state yeah. um, to. Um, it's not that they need the time to prepare. Mm -hmm. It's just again, you just, just get a fresher exactly, jury, exactly. Get a I mean, clean I mean, page in the notepad. You know, it's like uh, like if you go to a museum. At some point, you're like, I can't see it anymore. You know, <laughs> that's so me after like, ten minutes. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, some ten minutes, some an hour, but it even you know, a jury, that's a lot of time to be processing and and having all of that incoming. Um, so then, Craig, what's what's in your notebook? Um, I want to work our way backwards because I, I <laughs> want to bring our audience into what's happening right now. And what's happening yeah, right yeah. now is is what, what the, the the hallmark of the state's case has been precision, but also um, a nimbleness, an ability to adapt to what the defense is putting before the jury and the, and the judge. And and they seem to have adapted to what Blanche did this morning. Right. They're really. I think they've pivoted. I mean, and and. Um, Josh Steinglass got up. It was interesting. We were talking about it. We yeah. we take the subway from court <laughs> up here every day, so we get a good chat session. And we were talking about um, Josh Steinglass's closing and how he started. It felt quite abrupt. It was interesting because he right away made a decision to address some of the things that Donald Trump's lawyers had brought up, some of the things about Michael Cohen's credibility. Um, there, was a, there was a great moment about the call. I, I thought that was one of the best moments that we saw where he, there's that call that's in question where Michael Cohen calls, um, uh, calls Keith Schiller. And is it about the harassing phone calls that Michael Cohen had been getting from a 14 year old or was it something to do with Stormy Daniels? And Josh Steinglass actually in that, uh, it, he, he, he made up a, he kind of role played the call and fit it in, I think, into 92 seconds. So he, at the beginning, it, it did feel a bit abrupt, but he decided to address some of these things right away. Um, but I think that the main thing that came out of this morning, when you distill it all, there was some issues, you know, where the Donald Trump's lawyers looked first at, uh, that the, that the payments were legal. That was one of their first things. But the main thing that they did was go after Michael Cohen mm -hmm. over and over and over. They called him, you know, the 
the gloat, mm -hmm. greatest liar of all time, mm -hmm. and they, they just kept hammering home that he is a liar and that you can't believe anything he said. I think that was sort of the underpinning. Some of their stuff, I thought, though, it, it, it was weak. There was the, you know, they, they started out, and in a vacuum, it felt like a smart idea to argue that these were payments for legal services, but then they put on the screen the, the you know the now famous exhibit is it exhibit thirty five yeah, yeah 36. where we've got the you know the gross up where, where Alan Weiselberg grosses it up and and then they go in and, and Donald Trump apparently signed off on it Michael Cohen takes it to him and and they're saying that's for legal services but it's done on a page that's it's the wire transfer to Stormy da for the Stormy Daniels payment. Like, right. come on! Like, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have put it up in the first instance, but I wouldn't have let it linger there. If the jury had forgotten it was on the paper that you know was the wire transfer, they remembered it this morning. It was just another reminder, and it really did defy common sense. I mean, when you're looking at it, like it's not for legal services; it's on that paper.